for the event you've all been waiting for. Um, so it's great to see so many people um, attending today. So for most of you, Fiona won't need any introduction at all. Um, so Fiona uh, is going to be talking to us today about painting bats around the world. And obviously um, Fiona is internationally recognized for her, her work um, and her books, but also her incredible um, illustrations. Fiona is, has got a, a BA degree um, bio, in biology from Cambridge University. Um, she then went on to do an MSc in animal behavior from um, SUNY at Sunnybrook in New York. Fiona has written and, and illustrated dozens of books, um, and two in particular we're going to be um, chatting maybe a bit more about today, is A Field Guide of Mammals of Central America and Southeast Mexico, and also Peter's Field Guide to Mammals of North America. And Fiona actually illustrated, but also wrote these books. She's also illustrated uh, The Golden Guide of Bats um, Around the World, um, Bats of Papua New Guinea, um, and Mammals of Neotropics. And um, Fiona has also co-authored and illustrated Bats of Trinidad and Tobago, um, which was published in 2016. Fiona has worked part-time um, as an eco-tour guide um, for over 33 years. And actually, I met Fiona in Zambia when she was actually uh, running one of these uh, tour guides. So she does uh, numerous trips um, and really amazing location. So I would recommend you have a look at Fiona's um, website and the link is there, but I'll also pop that in the chat. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Fiona. Thank you so much everybody for signing up. Um, I'm, yes, I, I put together a talk which is quite different from anything I've ever done before. So we'll see how it goes. I'm totally, and, and I'm also really inept with technology. So bear with me when I sign up. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about basically yeah about painting bats around the world and my and and give some information about many of the bats that I have drawn so that it's not just you know I did this and I did that. So I guess I will get started and thank you Rachel, for the introduction and for inviting me. Here we are painting bats around the world. Um, that's me in in uh, Trinidad. Uh, underneath a really big silk cotton tree uh, where we caught the wonderful white-winged vampire. So um, that was a, just a start. Um, so yeah, starting out, my first, the first bats I ever handled, I also painted. I'd never like had a bat in hand. And I was in uh, Venezuela and I ran into a group of scientists there, uh, including John Eisenberg and Don Wilson. And they were working on mostly on the howler monkeys, but Don also did some netting. And um, he, since I was painting birds at the time, he said he suggested, and John suggested, well, why don't you try painting mammals? And so I thought, well, that would be really cool. And so I painted these three bats. For those of you like um, Bruce and Nancy, you will realize that this bat is misidentified. Whoops, I have to go back now. Um, this is actually a Cicopteryx here, not a Rhynchonycteris, but I don't really know how that came about. But anyway, in 1980, that's what I identified it as. So I was holding these bats and painting them by headlamp and they were squeaking a bit. So I said to Don Wilson, why, why is this bat squeaking? He says, well, you're holding it too hard. Just like be, hold it really softly. It won't get away. So anyway, that was my first experience with painting bats from life many years ago. Um, and because I worked with them for a week or so, um, it, it eventually led to my first commission painting mammal art. I'd been doing other illustrations like sea creatures and such, but, um, and that ended up being a three volume series on mammals of the neotropics, um, which was written by John Eisenberg and Kent Redford. And, um, it made me really interested in bats, um, but I also, ended up not being able to travel, you know, it was on a tight budget. So I did a lot of work just from museum specimens and it's very difficult to get a feel for what the animals look like in life when you're just using, especially in those days when there weren't that many photos. Um, most of the bats were, you know, very limited in terms of the photography. These days it would be easier, but there's still nothing like actually having an animal in hand and really figuring out what they actually look like. So I had, uh, 
very keen desire to spend more time with live bats and um, you know wanted to to do a different type of project but just as an aside one of the first um, mammals I painted there was a howler monkey and this is a uh, up here is John Eisenberg and somebody else I can't remember who that is with they were drugging them, shooting them with tranquilizer darts, and then sort of running underneath with a hammock to try and catch the monkeys. Um, and that's me all those many years ago with a howler monkey that I then put on my desk and it sort of slowly revived and started grabbing hold of me. It's very difficult to untangle yourself from a monkey because uh, they have a prehensile tail, so you can't get all four limbs and tail off you. They just keep wrapping something around you, but it was incredibly good fun. One of my greatest memories, I think. Um, so I decided to do something, you know, tackle something a bit smaller than the whole of South America, but a bit more manageable and do um, Central America. I can't see the titles of these things. How do I get that thing to go away? Anyway, um, never mind. Um, I thought I would work on my own book, uh, doing a field guide to mammals of Central America. And initially I wasn't really going to do every single bat or rodent, but I became pretty obsessive about trying to find them all and draw them all. But to begin with, I just did a lot of uh, study sketches. And this is a composite of various, well, it's a, actually it's one painting, but um, shows a variety of species in the genus Corolia. Um, they're kind of uh, extremely common bats, Corolia, but they're really important because they're um, one of the species that specialize on eating the fruit of pioneer plants like Piper and Cecropia, and they carry the fruit a long way. So they deposit the seeds well away from the parent plant, unlike birds, which sort of hop around, eat and uh, defecate in the same area. So bats are much more effective for seed dispersal. And Corolla are really important in that because they, they'll take the seeds of pioneer plants which need to get established before the conditions are ripe for mature forests to grow. So even though um, I'm sure many, many Central American and South American bat biologists sort of go, oh no, not another Corolla. When you get like nets full of Corolla, these are really um, incredible bats. So anyway, I spent some time studying bees and numerous other species. Um, I was, went on a trip to the Yucatan um, and we're there we caught some really interesting bats, including this incredible bat, um, Centurio senex. We caught actually quite a lot of them. Um, the, this is the male, hopefully you can see my arrow, and this is the female. And the male has this incredible sort of white Santa beard that he can pull up over his face and hook onto these flaps that come off his ears. Um, they also have sort of gold eyes and long dark hair and white spots here. And they have this amazing lattice pattern in the wings that sections are translucent and other sections are pigmented. Um, it's not really known why they have that lattice pattern, but these bats are, um, just recently have been shown to form lex, which is something that's quite uncommon in, in bats. In Africa, you have the hammer-headed bats that form lex, but um, in, in the New World, I think this is probably the only species that's actually been proven to have lex. Um, I may be wrong about that, but it's the only one I can think of that's known to have lex. And the males perform um, and the females come in, to, in a group situation. So that, that's what a lek is about. The, the, the males are, are performing to attract females. Um, and Centuria is interesting because sometimes there are a whole lot of them in one area and then you could go to the same place around the same time of year, a year later, and they, there won't be any. So they, they sort of move around, which I guess is partly due to their lekking behavior. Anyway, that was a very exciting bat for me and um, I spent a lot of time studying those because they're, they're so interesting. Um, this is actually a leaf nose bat, even though it doesn't really seem to have a nose leaf. It's all sort of smashed into the face. The, supposedly the short jaw structure enables them to bite into very hard seeds. Um, but other theories say that the, all these wrinkles on the face make it possible for soft 
juicy fruit to end up in the mouth. So um, there's not that much known about their actual diet in the wild. Um, um, other bats that I caught in this area and painted from life, um, the hairy-legged vampire is one of the three species of vampire bats. Um, it's a bird specialist. And I was, again, in, in Campeche um, with some nets up and I was with a team of people that were primarily interested in rodents. So I took over all the bat work. I set up uh, as many nets as I could handle and I ran them for as long as I could stay awake. Um, and so I was out by myself all the time. And um, I approached this one net and it was an area of no trails. So you sort of had to cut your own trails. It was only one main road, which um, was a bit difficult, but there I was sort of off trail. Um, and I saw this bat in the net and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I looked, oh my goodness, that's my first um, diphyla, the, the hairy-legged vampire. Um, it's definitely the cutest of the vampire bats. I'm biased maybe, but it's a very, very uh, attractive little bat. And I was in the process of getting it out of the net when um, I, almost, I was about halfway through getting it out of the net when I realized that something was biting me. And I looked down and I was completely covered in amiats. They traveled all the way up my legs and only started biting me when they got to my waistline. So I had a choice <laughs> as to whether to leave the bat and deal with the ants or stay with the bat. I decided to just keep on untangling this bat and get him out of the neck because I really wanted it to be able to draw it. And then run to the side of the path and just take off all my clothes because everything was just covered in ants. Um, I went back and told everybody this had happened and they were singularly unimpressed. I don't know why. It was, it was very unpleasant. But anyway, I did at least get the bat to draw. Um, the one below was one of the first free tail bats I, I got up close with um, and had time with. Um, it says in the text there, La Tadarida, but it's now Nictinomops. Um, and this was in Ushmal. We went into the site and um, tried to get people out of the building that we wanted to go in to get bats out of crevices. And um, it's actually quite tricky to do it with a pair of forceps, long forceps and try to get these bats out before they back away. Um, these bats have really hairy toes and these short stubby legs. This is sort of sort of new to me. This structure where the um, the toes and legs are very stubby, but they they use them to back into crevices, and they also have hairs on the rump, the bristles on the rump, which can be important in diagnosing the species. Um, so we managed to to get one or two out and uh, draw them, and then let them go. Um, so that was a, a good one for me to. Uh, so I was basically just trying to get to know all the bats, to be able to identify them and um, get to know what they really look like. Um, so how do I go about painting bats? Well, I typically will put, used to put them into a plastic container, like this one with hardware cloth on the top, so that I can see like how they like to rest and get an idea. Um, I try to always paint them life-size because then I can measure the forearm, the legs, the head and body length, and so my proportions are not too far off. Um, I also, with a lot of bats, they, if they don't like being in these containers, which is often the case, then I will just hold them for a brief while and then put them in a cloth bag, let them rest while I work on my painting, and then when I need to remember what, what I'm doing, then I get them out again. Um, Molosses like this uh, molosses over here on the left um, are, are very relaxed. Uh, they they can't gain lift easily and take off, so they tend to just sit in your hands very calmly. And actually, I find most bats, if you um, work with them for a while in a quiet situation, they are generally extremely um, calm and nice animals, with a few exceptions. But in in general, um, you know, I try to feed some of the bats. Um, you can also see here, I cover the rest of the painting with um, uh, trans, uh, you know, tracing paper, which I use to dry my brush because I use a pretty dry brush technique. And whoops, um, and um, you have to do this because 
I tend, if I get like five bats of the same species, I'll usually pick a male to hold on to because a female might be pregnant with a small infant or post lactating or, or pregnant lactating anyway. So it's a little bit less stressful for an animal. Um, but males, of course, can pee in whatever direction they choose, which can be quite hazardous when you're working with watercolor. So anyway, um, I try it. That's why I cover the paper. Um, and also working outside a lot in the tropics is sort of a constant drip of various uh, things from the trees and uh, try to keep everything under control. And in the early days, my fingers were always so bitten up by bat bites. I had um, band-aids, plasters on my fingers, which make, which stain the paper. They're absolutely awful. So you really have to make sure your fingers don't touch the paper that you're working on. Um, I think this one here is a phylostomous discolor, and the, you can see why I have a bad back. Um, okay, here are a couple of little, whoops, a um, couple of small bats that I was really happy to encounter when I was really sort of going after as many species as possible. Both of these I caught in Tortuguero in Misnets. Um, the one on the left is the um, long legged bat. And, as you can see, it does have pretty long legs, long tail, extremely long calcar, the bone from the ankle, and big feet. And these tiny bats behave in a way similar to fishing bats in that they trawl the surface of the water for emerging insects. And um, they're just uh, quite different from so many other um, like big -eared, small big-eared bats. They have a much bigger nose leaf than, than most of the little tiny gleaning bats, um, as well as having big ears. And the underside, I, you can't really see that well here in this picture, but the underside of the tail membrane has sort of tiny warts in lines. And um, I don't really know if anyone's looked at why that is the case, but it may have something to do with the fact that they're, they're trawling and they, they need to detect where the water is or what's on the surface of the water. Anyway, it's quite uncommon to catch these, but you do sometimes find them in culverts, um, under roads and stuff, usually near small streams. Um, and this one on the right um, is a bat I really wanted to catch, uh, Centronictris. It's one of the sac wing bats, the Imbalanurids, but it doesn't actually have a wing sac. Um, and they're very slow, agile flyers, and they seem to be able to detect and avoid nets. I, I don't think they're particularly uncommon. I mean, they seem to be that way when I was trying to catch them, but now that people are doing more recordings, they seem to be fairly common. They have the interesting roosting behavior of roosting on their own, um, each bat is solitary and under a leaf. And, um, I have the I have a property in Costa Rica and there we catch them there and so I've been spending hours and hours staring at the undersides of leaves but there are a lot of leaves to look at it's very difficult to find one small brown blob that's not just a, a flaw in the leaf or some other kind of defect so they're pretty hard to track down but I've seen them on leaves and um, now I've caught a few more but they're um one of the one of the many kind of interesting little imbalanured bats that um, you know you don't catch very often. Um, and like by catching and studying bats, I, I learned a lot more about the bat morphology and the diversity, and sort of got really obsessed with how you tell each bat apart in the field rather than just from a museum specimen. So trying to figure out ways of telling related species apart not using um well cranial characters are really difficult obviously teeth are also quite difficult it's not that easy to get a bat to hold its mouth open some of them love to do it but most of them don't and then to be able to see the details of the wrinkles in the molars and that kind of thing is is very difficult with a live animal so i sort of focused on ways of telling them apart um without using the using more of the external characters um and on the left, we've got another sac wing bat. And this one actually has a sac. That's what it looks like on the inside of the wing. And on the outside, it's just a slit. And these bats um, have been shown again quite recently that they, um, this is not a glandular sac. It's a sac that's a storage sac. 
act. So these bats put uh, urine and um, uh, uh, sweat and um, saliva and other any other bodily secretions they can come up with into the sack and make a nice smelly odor that the males use to salt their females. They live in harems. Um, they often roost on buildings, but and also on or in big hollow trees. Um, and the, the male will defend a, a harem of females and he marks his females with this uh, lovely liquid. Um, on the right, this mesophila is related to the bat that everyone knows and loves, a little ectophila, but it's also um, very, very scarce in Central America, but more common in South America. And they make tents, so they, they tend to roost in tents that are kind of low to the ground in Anthurium. But, um, and then uh, this bat was amazing to find. This is a uh, one of the mustache bats, the Mormopidae, and um, this is a uh, Pteranotus gymnotus. It's the larger one of the two naked-backed bats. And even though they look like they have a naked bat back, the wings join along this line here. So if you have the bat in the hand, you can slide your finger underneath this right up to here and it's furry underneath. I thought that was amazing. I had no idea um, that they would have a furred back under the naked back. Um, and this uh, bat here is another one of the frugivores, uh, Stenaira, that they have a really nice kind of velvety sheen to them. Um, it's just a quick pencil study. And um, they have like no tail membrane, no tail, and they they seem like they probably use their sort of quite sturdy hind legs for clambering around in vegetation. And they'll eat a lot of small solanaceous fruits. Um, so eventually I started putting all these things together. I did a lot of these paintings actually in the field and then I filled in a few based on once you get to know a genus it's a little bit easier to to make related species um, so there's the centurio and the, the female and male and uh, that's the mesophila and this is a well-known uh, little Honduran white bat that makes tents and lives in these tents of uh, cut leaves and on this side, we have um, a lot of myotis. Uh, everybody's familiar with pretty much around the world. Um, a rogiso, which is the smallest bat in Central America, and a few other small species. These ones are particularly interesting, the Thyroptera. Um, at the time of working on this, I hadn't seen this species, but now we, we recently got records from um, my property in Western Costa Rica, Southwest, uh, it wasn't known from the Pacific. Um, these bats are best known if you know where to look for them. The Thyroptera tricolor um, roosts in coiled up leaves and it has to change roost every couple of days. Whereas this Thyroptera decifera roosts in dead leaves and it's sort of like upside down cones of banana leaf and it they roost in a cluster at the top of the cone. Um, and these ones roost in right side up, sort of much narrower cones of live leaves. But these ones can stay in the same roost for a month or so until the leaf starts just decomposing. So they, you can see they have these suction cups on the thumbs and on the feet. Um, it's really interesting bats. And there's been work done recently in Costa Rica but looking at groups of these bats and how they communicate. And apparently the cone can make, um, uh, the cone structure can, can amplify the call of a bat. So a bat inside the cone calls to its relatives so that they can find it because they have to change roots. As I said, they, the leaves only last like 24 to 48 hours. So, so they have to move around quite a bit. Um, Anyway, so um, this eventually turned into this big book, which took me forever to do. And um, now it's in the second volume. Um, I really wanted a bat on the cover, but it wasn't permitted. Um, anyway, that was my, my really serious venture into bats resulted in this book on all the mammals. 
Um, let's see. Um, while I was working on that, um, Frank Bonacorso invited me to illustrate a book on bats of Papua New Guinea. And I was pretty excited about that, but I really wanted to go there so I would see some of them from life and not just try and sort of put something together based on photos and specimens. Although the specimens were really useful, especially the ones at the American Museum, I have to say. Um, and so I went there, I went to Papua New Guinea for about a month. Um, I'll just talk about some of the really cool bats that I saw there and for the audience from Africa, we have a lot more teropids to look at, so more familiar type bats. Um, the one on the left, the masked flying fox, we were in New Britain and um, people knew we were interested in bats and brought us this bat and it was absolutely amazing looking creature with this, this mask pattern. The wings are sort of reticulated um, white and brown and uh, just really, really stunning bat. Um, and it was really, really nice natured as well. I had the bat in my hand and it was just really, really sweet. Um, and Frank and uh, Brian, his uh, co-worker were, kept saying, oh, she's this, she's that. And I, I said, well, it, why are you, you know, why are you calling she just because she's pretty and sweet? It's not, it's a he, it's a boy. And they said, but it's lactating. And in fact, this was the case. It was a male that was lactating. So there was a record already of bat, a bat from Borneo that lactates, but this was the first record for a, a um, bat in the genus Tropus and from this area where a male was actively making milk. So it was really incredible. Um, and uh, anyway, that was, that was exciting. We had this um, variable flying fox. It was a youngster that we had, and it was super tame and cooperative. So I did a little portrait of it. It wasn't for the book. It was just because it was such a nice little bat. Um, and then uh, some more of the bats that I really enjoyed there. Um, the barebacked bat, the Dobsonia, we caught in near um, space on, on the mainland. And um, I put this bat inside an aquarium because it's a huge bat um, and it was very unhappy about the whole situation. I think I sort of captured that like discontented look in its face. But anyway, it was it was a lovely, lovely bat and nice to see a, a bare backed bat in a totally unrelated group. And again, it's the, the wings are just joined up here to the body. So it's furred underneath the wing. Um, and uh, one of the most I think probably the most gorgeous bat I've ever seen is this um, Melanicturus melanops, the, the black bellied bat. It doesn't really have a black belly. It's sort of, it's very dark, but with buffy tips to the black fur. Um, and they have this really incredible pink and black wings, um, a, a beautiful black mask, white nose, this really lovely thick orange fur. And um, probably the worst personality of any bat I've ever worked with. We had a couple of them for a while because um, they were going to take them back to the mainland for more studies. And they lived on the curtains of the, the room we were in and they would stare and hiss malevolently whenever I tried to catch them. And the, it was one of the few bats that never ever stopped trying to bite me the whole time I worked with it. And they actually have a really long canine tooth. I don't know if you can see, but down, there's a little sort of groove in the lower lip where the canine tooth fits. So they're, um, even though they're frugivores, they are <laughs> not the most nice personality, but they certainly were incredibly attractive bats. I don't think I've ever painted such a beautiful creature before or since. Um, Another very nice uh, bat, for me, the Hippocideros were fairly new bats to be painting. You know, they have this leaf nose structure and this diadem leaf nose bat um, was another one that we caught and uh, I really enjoyed getting to know a bit better. Um, it, uh, it's an insect eating bat, sort of an aerial insectivore. Um, and interestingly, this, this species in other areas is brown and uh, it's only in Papua New Guinea where it's uh, black and white but the markings were really quite striking lovely 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 bat um, 
So this eventually ended up being a completed book, um, Bats of Papua New Guinea, and we got my favorite bat on the cover, which was nice. Um, this is one of the layouts that I did, but eventually the, the book uh, took a different form. It became kind of, it was going to be a big book and then a, sort of a loose leaf type book, and then it ended up being a smaller book. So if you have this book, you won't see this page that I created. They kind of moved everything around. But this shows some of the, the little um, nectar bats um, and the, the melanicturus, and then a lot of tube nose bats. And these bats have incredible look, rolled nostrils. We, we caught this bat um, in, a, in a place we visited, and it's a paranectamine, and it actually has green wings. It's really amazing. But a lot of them have these yellow or white dots on the wings and striking markings. Um, they're frugivores, um, really very, very, very different from bats that I had got to know elsewhere. Um, my next big project was doing um, <laughs> bats for North American mammals, which is much closer to home and even includes a few bats I could find on my own property in Ontario. I set a few nets in the back by, by some of our vernal pools. And I even managed to get bats onto the cover of the book. So that was nice. Um, so a little brown bat and big brown bat, a couple of Vespertilionids. We only really have Vespertilionids here in Ontario. We don't have any other, uh, any other families of bats. Um, but of course, in North America, there are a lot of others, um, other bats. Um, so for these ones, I did most of these ones um, I worked out where they were going to go on the page and I painted them directly from life onto these pages. Um, the spotted bat, which is of course the, probably the most iconic bat in North America, um, was um, a bat I had a really hard time finding. I didn't get to see this one in alive um, until well after I'd painted this picture. I finally caught them, a couple of them in the Grand Canyon uh, just a few years ago, um, I think about 2018. Um, but I'd already done this painting, but many, most of the other ones, all of these I, I caught and most of them I drew from life. And these are the Molossids. Um, this is the biggest bat in North America, the Eumops, uh, Eumops perotus. And, um, we caught this in Big Bend. I was working with, um, Lauren Ammerman and a group of students and, um, on an open wash, we had the net set up and people with good hearing can hear this bat flying overhead because they make a, a just an audible kind of ticking call. And suddenly the, the call stops and then there's this loud shrieking. And this means one of these bats has hit the net and they, when they really hit the net, they've traveled so fast the net kind of bounces back and forth. Um, so Lauren and I both kind of ran to the net and shoved the students out of the way to make sure that we could safely um, extract this bat and not lose it. Um, that was that was a great one for me. And Umops underwood eye is um, very limited in its distribution in the US and obviously doesn't make it up to Canada. And I went to Arizona um, to Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument and joined a group of researchers there. And the only place to catch this bat was over a big pond. Well, they call them tanks there, but it's not what I would think of as a tank. It's basically a large pond. And the pond was so big that we had to um, check the nets by boat. So um, they had, a, I think, three nets joined to each other that crossed the whole pond. We caught like um, several hundred of these Nictinomops femorosaca. There's one here. And uh, I think we also got from macro, no, no, we didn't get that one there, but it was mostly from Rosaka. And then finally we caught one of these Umops. And um, it, usually teams went out on the boat to try and extract the bats. It's, it's even though it's, there's no real current, the boat is sort of moving all the time. So you're trying to get a bat out of the net and the boat is moving away. So you're sort of like trying to hold onto the bat and not fall in. And the other hazard was that the, there were numerous tiny little midges and small flies that were obsessed with the salt in the corners of your eyes. So 
you couldn't really see. So you're trying to untangle, untangle bats on a moving platform without being able to see. And um, it turned out I, I'd done so much netting elsewhere that I was a bit quicker than other people. So they left me on the boat the whole night and everyone else got to trade off. Um, and so I was somewhat blinded by this, but anyway, it worked out really well because I got this lovely bat that I was able to work with the next day. and. Um, and paint from life. And it was just the most um, placid bat that sat on my hand the whole time. Um, and they, these big aerial insectivores, you have, when you let them go, you've got to really throw them up in the air so that they gain enough lift to take off. Um, and naturally, they, these ones roost in um, the organ pipe cactus so they can free fall from a good height out of a hole that is made by woodpeckers into, into the organ pipe cactus. Um, next big bat project I Trinidad and Tobago, and um, that was uh, done with Jeffrey Gomes, a, a Trinidadian biologist, naturalist, um, and I took a number of trips, often guiding groups. I did a couple with Bat Conservation International and some other groups. And one of the fun um, things we do there is go out to a sea cave. You have to sort of swim out to it from the boat. And um, these fishing bats ro roost in the sea cave. And as you can see in this photo, the, they can be either gray or orange. And the male gods is harem from outside of the group. Um, so I had already done Oops, I had already done that painting for my Central America book, but I did some more studies and to show the gray phase as well as the, the red phase. Um, here I am with an octilio in my hand. Uh, again, they're, they have, they're known as a saber tooth bat because they, can, um, they have incredibly long canine teeth, um, but they're always very uh, mellow when you have them out of a net. And as you can see, I know it's, um, incorrect form to not be wearing a glove, but they, they really don't bite. They're very gentle. And these bats fish. Um, and the, we went to visit somebody who had them by his house and he used to like to like throw a pebble as a fishing bat went past and they would come around to exactly the right spot and trawl to try and get uh, the fish when they, whenever they de detect any change in the surface. So the, the plunk of the pebble or a fish breaking the surface they're extremely good at go, returning to that exact spot and then using their massive feet and these massive claws um, to trawl. And the feet are sort of, the, the toes are, are compressed on the sides so that they're very narrow and they don't put up much resistance when they're being um, trawled through the water. They, they don't slow the bat down much. Um, so it makes it more efficient for feeding. Um, in Trinidad, we, we actually encountered a new species for the island when we were netting, um, Stichopteryx canescens, which was previously just known from um, South America. So here's a picture showing it, comparing it to the larger Stichopteryx um, leptura, um, tiny, tiny little bat. So I spent some time trying to draw the, that bat from life, which was, was fun. Um, so uh, it's another of these aerial insectivores, another one that has a, um, a wing sac. Um, not too much is known about the habits of that particular species. Um, and when we finally came to put the book together, I tried to show the bats at um, life size. I, I like to paint life size. Like I said before, it's easier to get the portions right, if you sort of can measure the forearm and the um, tibia and the head and body length and the ear length and all that sort of things, you can see if you're sort of way off or not. But I thought it would be really cool to show them life size. So the species accounts have the bats um, in amongst the accounts and uh, you can see the relative size, like this is a very much smaller bat, the, the McConnells and the hairy big eared bat, big eyed bat. Um, and the little eye, big eyed bat's pretty small too. That was another one that I hadn't seen in Central America. Finally tracked down in Peru, actually. Um, so it's different. There were a few bats that were just a bit too big for the page. So they were shown at a reduced size, um, but 
the other ones are all life size. And so the book finally came out. I didn't do the cover. Edward Rooks did this beautiful cover of the uh, Eurodama tent making bats and a, and a tent here. Um, another bat in flight, another tent up there. So really nice, nice painting. Um, we had groups including um, Dr. Merlin Tuttle came, and I think that might be one of his photos. Um, and that's Jeffrey, my co-author, the senior author. And we set up hop traps outside Tamana Hill Cave, where you get numerous um, bats of about seven different, seven or eight different species. And we also set up this raised harp trap in front of this really magnificent silk cotton tree, which I'm very sad to hear has fallen down, which is a great loss for many bat species that roosted in it. Here we were trying to catch the white winged vampire, which was uh, my first slide showing me uh, sketching that bat right by the tree. And we did succeed in catching, I think, just one, lots of other bats as well. but. Um, so that was a, um, sort of finally came out and um, still available. Um, then I, I do sometimes just go on holiday to see bats. And I, I went to Thailand with sort of two main goals. One was to catch a bumblebee bat. And the other was to see and, and paint the painted bats. I mean, how can you not want to paint a painted bat? Um, so we went to a, a cave in Thailand and um, was shown where the bumblebee bats were. And luckily we were allowed to, to catch a few to have a close look at. As you can see, they're really, really small. Um, this is crazy and nectarous, long, long guy. Um, and I tried to draw it life-size as is my normal way of drawing things, but it didn't really come out that well because it was so tiny. I did a few studies of it. Um, and eventually I, I had I did paint it in a slightly bigger format for the manual of the mammalia, probably one of the more recent books I've been working on um, with Jim Patton and uh, Doug Kelt. Um, so I did it a bit bigger there, but it was nice to have seen it and to know what that the strange little it's called Kitty's hognose bat and it does have sort of a, a pig like nose. Um, different from, from many other bats. So that was a, a big highlight. Um, and the other really was the painted bat, which I painted this bat in 1993. And so I, it's one I just really desperately wanted to see. And we managed to go to a little village where the, the children were particularly good at finding these bats. They used to actually eat them, but then um, ecotourism had sort of promoted them showing them to tourists so this was really a good thing all around um, and they roost kind of similar actually a bit similar to the way Thyroptera decipher roosts in, in coiled up dead banana leaves um, so this actually is supposed to show two bats as one on this side so this was a two in this um, so I spent a, a day in a rice paddy with one of these bats just um, drawing them. They're um, tiny little bats with quite a strong personality. It actually never closed its mouth. It was always glaring at me, furious. But uh, it was really amazing. And then at dusk, I was able to let it go. And they fly just like a butterfly over the surface of the water. And it almost seems like that maybe that's why they have this color. So they look more, more like a butterfly than a mammal. It's not so much of a useful food. but. I don't know, that's just speculation. Um, we painted, I painted various other bats there as well. It was a great trip, um, but that was just, uh, didn't lead to any books or anything, um, but it was exciting. Um, and for those of you in Africa, yes, I haven't actually done any books or anything on African bats, but I have painted a few. Um, one of the ones I really, really wanted to see, of course, was the yellow wing bat, absolutely gorgeous bat. And we we did get one on a trip I did with Merlin Tuttle in, in Uganda. So I had seen one once, but I never really had a chance to spend time with one. And then a trip I led to, to Ghana, we divided one day into sort of bat crazy and birders. And most of the people went off to look at some for some really rare birds and just me and the guide and, and one participant went batting. And um, it was a 
it was fun because I found a few of these yellowing bats and was able to sort of crawl into the bushes and spend some time just watching the bat that's photographed up here, this tongue out. And um, later I was able to do a painting of this bat and another really cool African bat, the Nycteris, um, which I showed in flight. These are were used in the manual of Mammalia. Very few pieces in that book are in color, but but I managed to get a couple of the bats done and in color for the cover. Um, so the, the Nycteris the, is really an interesting structured bat. It has this sort of slit up the face, uh, huge bunny ears, and a T-bone at the end of the tail. Um, I have no idea what that's for, but they're um, similar to some of our New World carnivorous bats and gleaning bats. And But they, I, we found in some of the roots that there were remnants of fish. So it's quite interesting that this bat also takes fish as well as um, small reptiles and amphibians and insects. Um, so it's got a pretty varied diet. And it's really nice looking bat. Um, and then I did a couple of paintings on commission for the bats that have been recently described. Um, this Rhinolophus hilli has an amazing, it's a, a horseshoe bat with this incredibly long cellar that um, really quite dramatic. Um, and Myotis nimbiensis. Um, another species that's um, similar to some of the bats that I had seen. I didn't, I didn't get to see either of these alive. They were done from photos provided to me. Um, but at least I had seen the Myotis uh, Wazawood guy that is from um, Zambia, which is very similar. And it's interesting how the wing pattern is quite similar to the painted bats in Thailand. Um, the two really spectacular bats that... Um, show that we don't know everything there is to know about bats and taxonomy and, and numbers of species even. Um, hopefully I'll have an opportunity to paint more African bats in the future. Um, and sometimes uh, just sort of random bat paintings done for fun or for logos or for children's books. Um, on the left is a painting I did for the Golden Guide showing a pallid bat catching a scorpion and um, the Noctilio in flight up here was also part of a piece I did for that and some logos for uh, the North American Society of Bat Research um, and a few more similar um, commissions and odds and ends. Um, a, a, bat, a flying fox from Sulawesi that's highly endangered. I did a, a poster for them. A friend commissioned me to do uh, tequila bats, so I came up with this design of the three species of bats that are um, indispensable in tequila, so um, that was my piece for her. Um, this was a competition of painting on a bat box, so I did a bat on a bat box, a bat house. Uh, the crack here, so I thought well, that would make a good reflection area. So. And another bat, another piece from the Golden Guide, various other sketches and such. Um, and finally, I got to put together a whole lot of my drawings of bats from various places around the world. I had also done a lot of European bats for the um, Echo, uh, Echo Meter Touch, the, um, the uh, app that you can get, the little unit you can buy for your phone. So I'd done all the European bats. So there's actually quite a lot of European bats in here. Um, and some of the other bats, you know, bats from all kinds of different projects. There's over 90 species of bats here, many of which I drew from life around the world. And it's a jigsaw puzzle that you can get from bat goods. So um, if you feel like you want to see a lot of bat heads, that's the place to go. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much to Bats Without Borders for their work in bat conservation and for in inviting me and luring me out of my cave. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Okay, I'm going to stop my share then. Excellent. I have no thank idea how long. No, that, that's brilliant. Sorry, and we were, we were, it was um, a little bit of a later start um, due to our, our, on our side, so there's no problem. But um, we've just got a couple of, of comments. I did so Lynn. Remember. 
had just said um, that there is a great video of um, Centurio lacking behavior available online. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's worth doing. Um, and Bruce had said, um, uh, where's, where's his comment? Uh, oh, the Puerto Rican Noctilio are ferocious. Um, so I think that was just with your, uh, the greater uh, fish eating bat <laughs> uh, description. So I guess, did you find them quite difficult to, to handle when you were, were doing actually the, the greater fish eating bat uh, kind of illustration? Well, they are, they are hard to get out of a net. Like, you know, they can be a bit mean, but once you have them out of the net, I found them always to be very mellow, but you know, the, it, it may depend on, you know, a lot of different factors, but yeah, they, they definitely have big teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I'm sure everybody is going to be green uh, with envy of all the, the amazing work you've done. I mean, the, your illustrations are, you know, just exceptional, but also just the, the, the amount of places you've been and the bats you've seen um, are just fantastic. So um, Isabella, who is um, an artist as well as a, as, as a bat person. So Isabella just said um, that she's uh, in absolute awe. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, she said she has a question. Do you have any tips uh, for getting accurate illustrations um, if you're unable to get a bat in the hand? Um, and also, how do you make sure the colors um, are correct if you are painting um, at night or, or you know, using a headlamp? Um, well, I just mentioned, so like, never use just one photo. For one thing, that's not really legal to copy copy a single photo. But the more, like, if I'm doing from photos, I try to cover my whole desk with photos with a little kind of corner for my, my own stuff in the middle somewhere so that you see different aspects. And um, if you have a chance to look at museum specimens, you can often get good ideas about fur. Like, I painted one, a couple of bats just direct from one individual and uh, like uh, the bat was sort of brilliant orange or deep chestnut brown and then I looked at the I looked at the the images um, on in a museum and all like completely different color so I, had, I couldn't really use those pictures for a field guide that, you know so there's a lot of variation even with live animals but spend time to actually visit you know, there's lots of that you can see back at the roots and so you can get a better idea but yeah color it, it is hard especially if you're working at night it's best if if you can feed the bat and keep it overnight and look at it the next day because you get a better idea of color but just try to see as many examples of each species both in terms of photos and live animals or museum specimens as you can to, to try to be accurate thank you you're welcome Excellent. And um, so, I mean, also, obviously, you, you, you know, you're based in, in a lovely place, obviously, in Canada, and but you're also are based in, in Costa Rica as well. But I guess, uh, would you say, I mean, because you, you've done field work all over the world, and, and it sounds like you've done some quite challenging um, field trips, you know, to get to, to species you were looking for. So um, it was quite nice that you were saying about your, your easiest and your, your hardest bats are supposed to handle. But what, what would you say has been maybe one of your most challenging or, or exciting field trips that you've done to go and find a bat that you were looking for? Oh, gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, really. Um, I guess some of the sort of cave trips, I'm not really a cave person, but, you know, of course, you can see really amazing bats in caves and stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I went to the Dominican Republic with John Hall and Vladimir Donetsk, two mammal watchers, um, mostly to see the Selenodon, which is an incredible mammal, but we were trying to get some of the bats there. And one of the ones I wanted to get is this one of this little relative to Natalis, it's a tiny little bat. And we had nets up where they were flying around and they just kept missing the net. And then the net fell down in the wind and landed on a bat. So it was really great. We got to catch the bat. But um, I don't know. There's just lots of lots of things. I think actually, well, the most exciting probably for me was catching the first sitterops because any bat that they're on at that time, there were no photos of a live sitterops. And so you're just using like a scrunched up museum specimen trying to get an idea of what it actually looks like, which, you know, is fine for the fur. But beyond that and you know or the wing length or whatever but it's pretty useless to try and figure out what the face looks like in a dried specimen a bit more so with if they're in alcohol but you know really nice so I actually caught them 
um, by getting a really big ladder and a really long hand net and trying to get underneath his coconut palm, which was way too high. And then the ladder sort of was, was collapsing and I ended up kind of on the ground, but I had caught them, so I didn't care. It was good. That was very exciting. Thank you very, very much, uh, Fiona, uh, for, for coming along today. And thank you very much to everybody else for joining. Um, and please check out our website. So if you look at uh, Bats Without Borders events and you can find out what's coming up next. Take care. Thanks, okay. Ben. Bye. Thank you. Bye.